So hello everyone. Uh, we are very glad to see you, uh, participants from all over the world uh, in this event, where we aim to show the variety of our family medicine doctor skills and their leadership in different uh, work environments. Our event will be moderated by, yeah, by myself, your host, Dr. Adi Yaski. Uh, I'm a family medicine resident in KMC, which is King Abdulaziz Medical City in Saudi Arabia. Uh, following for the National Guard Health Affairs. I'm the co-founder of letstalkmedicine.com. Also, I'm the Saudi representative for the Wonka uh, Young Doctors Movement, al Razi chapter. Also, my co-host for today is uh, Dr. Tania Penna. She's a board member for the College uh, of Family Medicine in Nuevo Leon in Mexico. Uh, also, she has a master's degree in education, also where she is a board member of uh, Amaili Wainakai Young Doctor Movement. Uh, excuse me, I think, yeah, Dr. Jasmine, if you can wait for the control, one minute. Okay, so uh, for today, each presenter will have 10 minutes for their topic, and then uh, at the end, we will have a section for questions. So please keep your questions uh, with the doctor name that you want to ask until the end. Uh, we'll follow us uh, through the, today's webinar. Dr. Francesco Molina as our voice in Spanish, also with Dr. Chloe Chan, where uh, she will translate to, uh, for us in Chinese. So I think the floor is for uh, Dr. Tanya. Okay, uh, thank you, Adele. So we will go over these topics. Uh, I'm gonna make a, we're, we're going to make a little introduction about each, each presenter. And I would like to start up with Dr. Lo Kuifen Jasmine. Uh, she's a family medicine specialist in Ministry of Health in Malaysia. She's a strong advocate of mental health with active involvement in promotion of mental health care. Also, uh, she's a team leader in domiciliary service with continuous effort to promote and improve domiciliary care. And she's also a women's health advocate as a speaker of pap smear and mammogram campaigns. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lowe for Jasmine for being here. So. Okay, Dr. Jasmine, I will give you, uh, Dr. Jasmine, I will give you the control. You can. Uh, Yes, just click uh, on the screen or by the arrows. All right. Um, good day to all. I'm uh, Dr. Lo Griffin from Malaysia. So today I'll be talking about family medicine as the pillar of the health system. So. This is the outline of my presentation. So I'll be talking about this, the healthcare delivery in Malaysia, the definition and domains of family medicine, the impact and the drivers of success of this uh, family medicine. So first of all, the delivery, um, healthcare delivery in Malaysia. So Malaysia is located in Southeast Asia. So it has a population of 30 million with a female to male ratio of one to one. So healthcare delivery system in Malaysia is uh, mainly under the Ministry of Health of Malaysia and generally has an efficient and widespread system of healthcare operating under a two tier system consisting of both government based and the public uh, healthcare system. So our healthcare delivery system encompasses curative, rehabilitative, promotive and regulatory concerns. So this diagram shows the provisions and care. So in Malaysia, the me medical healthcare services are provided at a public facility, which comprises of the three level, primary care, secondary care and tertiary level through a wide network of health clinics and hospitals. So primary care, is the pillar of this healthcare system in Malaysia by being the trust of the Malaysian healthcare system and supported by the secondary and tertiary care. So my next slides shows 
this uh, primary care is a hub of coordination. So what does it mean when I say that uh, primary health care is the pillar of the health care system in Malaysia? This graph shows us how primary care acts as a hub of coordination and networking within the community served and with outside partners and the services provided by the primary care doctors. So we can see that primary care team actually provide continuous, comprehensive and patient-centered care. And then uh, this is a hub of coordination and does not only care for acute and chronic diseases, but also it provides uh, networks within the community itself and provides a referral point uh, or to tertiary and specialized care in um, Malaysia. So examples of reference are to the non-governmental organizations, such as the Alcoholic Anonymous and Women's Shelters. We also provide training support to the academic institutions and uh, to training centers, and also tertiary referrals, specialized care referrals, diagnostic services, and specialized prevention services. All right. So next, as we can see, the Assess and reverse across sectors are pretty chaotic between the primary health care and secondary and tertiary health care and public versus private health care. So some may argue that this is actually good for the patient's choice, but it does not do any good in terms of continuity of care, which is very much required in chronic disease care. So this is where primary care step in as a as its role as a gatekeeper and also foundation of the healthcare system. So it acts as this interconnecting dot that we can see the dots here. It acts as an interconnecting dot between the public healthcare system and as a referral point to the secondary and tertiary care and across other agencies and private sectors as well. So primary care steps in as the gatekeeper. So this will reduce the inappropriate referrals and unnecessary cost to the patients as well. So next, I'd like to um, introduce um, the healthcare facility that we have in Malaysia. So uh, primary healthcare facilities are provided through 1,060 health clinics in Malaysia, 1,791 community clinics, and 239 mobile health teams, as well as more than 580 dental clinics as of 2020. So Family Doctor Concept is one of the initiatives which was um, initiated by the Ministry of Health Malaysia as a way forward to strengthen primary health care in Malaysia. So with an aim of one family, one family doctor. So this is a positive step to address the rising burden of disease and ensure that a white population can be covered by the primary health care facility. So I would like to give the definition of this uh, European definition 2011 of the general practice. So general practice of family medicine is an academy or scientific discipline with its own educational content, research, evidence based and also clinical activity and is a clinical specialty oriented to primary care. So this is the Wonka definition 1991, family medicine provides comprehensive care and is a generalist who accepts everyone from womb to tomb and um, uh, does not limit by age, sex, or gender or diagnosis. And we also provide contextual care in which we provide care for the patient in view of their, in the context of the family and the family in the context of the community, irrespective of the race, religion, culture, and social class. And we are also clinically competent. We provide comprehensive and continuity of care and we are professional. So next, um, I'd like to show you this is the Wonka Formula 3 is produced by the Swiss College of Primary Care, revised in 2011. So this Wonka tree emphasizes the holistic principle of family medicine in caring for the patient. So it outlines schematically the competencies which every family medicine specialist should have, which is primary care management, holistic modeling, comprehensive approach, specific problem solving skill, community orientation, person-centered care, in which we are elaborating in the next slide. As I mentioned just now, the six core competencies and it's broken down into 12 characteristics. So first of all, um, family medicine, primary care doctors are the first point of contact within the healthcare facility. So um, we work by 
making efficient use of the healthcare resources through coordinating care, working with other professionals in the primary care setting, and we develop a patient centric orientated to the individual, the family, and also um, the community, within the community. And we promote patient empowerment. And we have a unique consultation process which establishes relationship over time and provides effective communication between doctors and the patient. And we are responsible for the provision of longitudinal continuity of care as determined by the needs of the patient. And we provide this, we have a specific decision making process determined by the prevalence of disease specifically in the community. And we manage both simultaneously, the acute and chronic management. And then we manage these uh, illnesses, which represents in undifferentiated ways. So we also promote health and well being and have a specific responsibility within the community by providing physical, psychological, social, cultural, and existential dimensions. So I like to quote Sir William Osler. The good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So definition of primary care is a setting within a healthcare system, usually within the patient's own community, in which the first contact with the healthcare professional occur. So this is the Wonka definition, European definition of general practice, 2002. So in order to provide the best healthcare outcome and cost efficient care through the quality family medicine, one of the main trusts of WHO framework documents that the task is to define that which of the true unique activity of the family doctor, the true clinical generalist. We should through our okay, Jasmine, two minutes. Two minutes left. Preventive care and health education on self-care. So next, I'd like to touch a bit about the um, uh, declaration of Alma Alta, whereby this, uh, this is the declaration which, does, which is the first to underline the importance of primary health care and put health equity on the national international agenda. So the next is declaration of Astana, so which is uh, one of the essential steps towards universal health care system. So I like to talk about primary healthcare system and what it does. Um, this is a, a primary healthcare. It pr provides promotive, preventative treatment, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative care for all. Basically, it provides uh, well. Uh, it, it the center of the primary healthcare is health and well-being for all, and. Uh, is involved with multi-sectoral policy and actions, empowerment of people, and also provides essential public care. So this is the Sustainable Development Goal by WHO and, um, in uh, 2030. So I'd like to emphasize on this uh, point number three, which is good health and well-being. So good health and well-being, there are nine targets, right? So SDG 3.8, which is to achieve university health universal health coverage, leaving no one behind. It ensures that everyone everywhere access, can access health, uh, essential quality health without facing financial hardship. And it highlights the power of primary health care to advance the protection and promotion of health. So universal health care is a human right approach to health, and this can be achieved by being having a person-centered and integrated care with availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality health care through primary care health. 30 seconds. So, so this is my last slide. So the success of the uh, primary health care can be, uh, will be driven by knowledge and capacity building, human resources, technology, financing, empowering individuals and communities and aligned stakeholders support to national policies. So to end my presentation, I'd like to emphasize that primary care is the pillar and heart of the healthcare system. That is the end of my presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jasmine. Uh, that was a great talk for us. Uh, moving for family doctor in different areas uh, as in Spice Road, it will be with Dr. Zainab Mohammed from Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Zainab working as a fa faculty in one of the public sector universities of Karachi. 
and she will be discussing the webinar about practicing family medicine in different areas like an urban and rural setup. Uh, Dr. Zainab. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, am I audible? Is it clear? Is my yes, voice we clear? can hear you. Okay. Yes, okay. I will give you the control. You can just click and it will change. Okay. Okay. So should I start now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Adil, for the introduction. Uh, and the topic for today's um, uh, presentation and the talk of mine will be um, uh, family physicians working in different uh, areas. And today I'll be elaborating more on uh, how uh, family medicine practices in rural and urban areas of Pakistan. Uh, also, in order to know, uh, so as we move forward uh, with the slides, in order to know about the complete picture of family medicine in Pakistan, one must know uh, what are the healthcare system and how the healthcare functions in our part of the world. So um, let's begin. Okay. How do I go back? Okay, so the roadmap for today's presentation would be uh, that we'll go over the brief overview of healthcare system in Pakistan, the urban and rural health scenarios, uh, also discuss how a family physician can contribute to both herbal, uh, urban and rural setups, and what are the, what are the way forwards. Okay, so this is a brief slide on uh, the population of Pakistan, which is living in urban as well as rural areas. So Pakistan having a population of approximately 180 million, we have uh, almost 61% or a va vast number or a big chunk of our population residing in rural areas as compared to only 39% of the population residing in urban um, centers. So uh, this uh, this is a huge number. These are huge numbers, which um, family medicine or family physicians or GPs have to cater in order to um, uh, treat them. Okay, so this is a um, healthcare pyramid on the healthcare system organization that how family med or how healthcare system functions in Pakistan. So the primary healthcare basically uh, comprises of uh, basic health units, rural health set centers and dispensaries. As, and this we have for our primary care setup. And for secondary, we have secondary care, we have tertiary care hospitals and district health quarters. And then we have these tertiary care facilities. So this is the healthcare pyramid that uh, should be and ideally should be followed. However, the system of, uh, and this part of the world is not as organized um, as it's depicted in the picture. So there are a lot of loopholes and there are a lot of uh, issues and there's lack of integrate, integration with, with uh, uh, there's a lack of horizontal as well as vertical integration between all these systems. So when a patient arrives in a primary care on a secondary care, so there is there is lack of follow-up and there is lack of, ref, uh, there is a referral system. However, there's lack of integration and the patient does not, is referred, is, does not get referred back to the GP or the family physician that he or she first came from. So, um, so this is uh, this is the basic healthcare system of uh, Pakistan. So moving on. Okay, so this uh, the next slide shows the percentage distribution of health consultations in private as well as public dispensaries, uh, rural versus urban. So as it's shown in the uh, chart or the uh, as it's shown in the chart. So we have um, uh, so as we have approximately seventy five to eighty percent of the population which uh, goes which depends on the private or the private hospital hospitals uh, outpatient clinic as well as dispensaries for their uh, treatment and only 20 to 25 percent of these uh, population are dependent upon the public hospitals and public hospital dispensaries uh, so yeah so so 80 percent approximately 70 to 80 percent of this population goes to uh, ha has to bear the uh, financial cost of it has to pay from the pocket in order to get treated uh, so this is uh, this is a major issue Uh, next is the human resource. Uh, I just I wanted to give a brief human resource and the lack of um, human resource and lack of physicians per 1,000 population um, at present. So we have uh, 
approximately 0.82 physician per 1,000 population, and there is a lack of or a deficit of uh, one physician per 1,000 population at the moment. And the available workforce at the moment is 1.45 per 1,000 population. Similarly, if, it's, if we, there's a next diagram, the, the right one, if we see the urban rural distribution of human resources for health in Pakistan, so we have approximately 14.5% of physicians which are working in the urban setups and only approximately 3.6% of the physicians are working in the rural setups. Um, similarly goes for nurses and midwives, 7.6% in the urban population and only 2.9% in the rural setup. So this lack of um, healthcare resources, this lack of human resources basically in the rural population also has a lot of disadvantages. And, uh, um, uh, catering uh, and a lot of unmet needs of these rural health, uh, rural uh, population of the country. Okay, so how is primary care delivered? Deli how is primary care services delivered in Pakistan? So there is a huge or is a large network of primary care service and referred hospitals here. Uh, there are community health worker and community health programs and lady health worker programs. Approximately one uh, lakh health lady health workers who are integrated and who are primarily working on the WHO based Millennium Development Goals, and they try to. Um, uh, they try to, they are basically working on the eight goals provided by WHO in uplifting the rural and the urban health population in the rural and the urban slums. And they, they provide household services in, uh, in, managing, um, uh, in managing poverty, in providing uh, cleanliness, in educating the uh, patients and empowering women and uh, basically cleanliness. Uh, along with that, we along with these uh, community-based programs, there are 11 uh, vertical health programs uh, which provide technical and financial support. Uh, private sector also only comprises of 35% of all physicians and 17% of the hospital beds in the country. Um, so primary health, uh, primary health care is, however, then mostly uh, rely on the general practitioner, which are doing individual practices. There are maternity homes, there are polyclinics and laboratories. Okay, so when we talk about primary health services provided by general practitioners um, and all these services, we have family physicians which are also working in the community. We have public and private hospitals which have departments, including uh, of family medicine, which have family physicians working um, in these uh, setups. And there are public hospitals which have opened up clinics in the community to, in order to cater the population of, in order to provide the cost effective upon a person centered care in the community. However, the key challenges still include a non-standardized care, irrational use of medicine, and missed opportunities to provide preventive care. So when, a, when we talk about these key challenges, we talk about these untrained GPs and uh, untrained uh, general practitioners who are providing uh, primary care services in the community and in, um, in these clinics. Okay, so um, so this is a, a slight idea of where we live in rural versus urban setups. According to World Bank, there are 70% 70, 70 of the South Asian population still residing in rural areas and rely on agricultural needs and everything for their um, livelihood. Uh, poverty is a big issue, uh, which, uh, which eventually leads to um, uh, uh, unmet health needs of rural population as well as urban population. Uh, and eventually leading to increased rates of uh, chronic diseases, perinatal mortality, infant mortality, and malnutrition in this part of the world. There are also decreased physician and nurses. There is increased uh, transportation barriers if we talk about uh, physicians and uh, nurses and health workers working in rural setups. So these are big Dr. barriers. Zainab, two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, these are okay. So these are uh, big barriers uh, for physicians as well as health working who want to practice in rural setup. Also, these transportation barriers also have a huge impact on the patients who, um, who we refer if, in, 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 in rural setups. Uh, so there's a low doctor-patient ratio, poor access to healthcare, which make it difficult to achieve health goals in rural setups. So the pictures I have kept here is, the, is, uh, is, the rural, is a rural clinic and the rural health setup where I had worked uh, for a couple of uh, months in order to provide healthcare to the rural population. 
So, uh, so there is, um, so in the Northern areas of Pakistan, there is um, public private partnership uh, by Aachen Development Network, and it works in coordination, which uh, there are multiple uh, primary and secondary care hospitals, uh, which provide, uh, this is an 18 bedded hospital, which provide primary and secondary care services. There are a lot of orthopedic care patients, there are uh, obstetric care patients, with the, uh, the, the population over there rely on antenatal care services, ultrasound services and uh, the orthopedic care suturing. So all these primary and secondary and urgent care services are provided in these rural hospitals because once you refer the patient, the, refer the patient does not reach right away. There is a long distance that the patient has to travel. So one has to stabilize the patient before they uh, refer. So number one, knowledge, number two, competency, and number three, um, you know, having an idea as to how to practice in such uh, areas is a difficult task. And uh, GP does that and a family is trained to do that. So this is an urban health center where uh, we practice. These are uh, there's the um, uh, and uh, provide free of cost. Um, uh, there's one in Chennai, one in Chittor. These are part of our community centers in Karachi, where we provide <coughs> where we provide uh, primary care services. There's a picture with undergraduate students and with uh, these are the postgraduate trainees who we train. Uh, try to help uh, the TB control program. Try to uh, create, uh, try to generate uh, camps and create camps so that we can uh, empower and we can treat the and do the screening of these uh, general of the local community population and provide care. I think, so why is uh, Dr. Care? Uh, Zainab, oh, okay. uh, we are running out of time. Uh, okay, so I'll just. Uh, um, I'll, uh, okay, if you want to mention something, you please, Zain. Okay, I'll just, uh, for, uh, I'll just uh, end my slide with uh, what needs to be done more and uh, in order to uh, do more on prime, uh, family medicine in Pakistan. We need to shift the focus from tertiary care to primary care. They need to improve standards of primary care, incorporate family medicine in under, undergraduate curriculum. And there is a lot has to be done in, uh, in order to provide integration between various components of primary care. Um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zaidab, uh, for your great presentation. Now, up next, I have the great honor to introduce you to Dr. Brando Javier Cantu Lozano, who is going to tell us about Family Doctor as the leader of the health team. He's from Buenacay in Latin America. He's a family doctor from the Univers Universidad de Monterrey, national coordinator for anthropology in Amejali, Buenacay, member of the Colegio de Medicina Familiar del Estado de Nuevo León, He's Chief of Medical Services in the Mexican Social Security Institute. So Dr. Brando, go ahead with your presentation, please. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Adel, can you help me with the uh, changing of the slides? Uh, you have the control. You can change, Dr. Brando, from you. Just click. Okay. It's not working. Uh, I believe it changed. Yes. Okay, I will change. Mm. Okay, can you put the, the first slide, please? Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Wainakai, and I'll receive for the opportunity of being a speaker here with you today. I am from Mexico, and as an overview, Mexico is considered a country in development. Our population has grown exponentially since the 1960s. That distribution of our population, as you can see in the picture, has been changing from, from the 1950s to the 2020s. We have 79% of the population on urban areas and only 21% on the rural areas. This distribution is because um, the people are migrating, looking for better paid jobs, better health opportunities, and better education. Mexico is one of the founding members of the United Nations since 1946. And as a member, Mexico had the obligation to follow the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. This being said, every Mexican has the right of access to a good quality of health. Can you change the slide, please? Mexico's health system. The universal access to health for every Mexican is given by the public health system. Any employee of a business has the right to demand the employers to pay a small fee to the social security institutions for them to give health coverage for the worker and their whole family. There is a variety of public health institutions giving service to either workers or 
and military personnel. The Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, IMSS, is the biggest social security institution in Latin America and currently gives health services to more than 60 million Mexicans with and without social security, accounting for almost half of the country's population. For population without social security, we have private medicine and the Secretary of Health gives coverage for, with specific programs for prevention and treatment. Next slide, please. In Mexico, the family doctors regularly work in family medicine units, which range from less than 10 to more than 30 consultories, each with a population above the 4,000 users. The family medicine units are composed of a variety of health professionals, from family doctors, nurses, psychologists, nutritionists, dentists, medical residents, and administrative and maintenance workers. This is a logo we designed on a symposium we organized in 2017 during my years of medical residence. The intention of this logo is a family doctor helping in the construction of a family, but we are not alone. Around the family doctor, we have our team of health professionals. As family physicians, we are the leaders of this health team. We are the ones to identify the specifics on a patient situation, to give them counseling, to promote prevention, and to give care when needed. Part of this is knowing the limits of oneself and knowing the strengths and capabilities of the health team around us. It is proven that the more health professionals that work together on a patient, the best the outcome can be. Next one, please. There is an enormous amount of information on the subject of leadership. In the big picture, it can be separated into two major aspects, the individual characteristics and the teamwork. Depending on the author, you can find several traits and characteristics leaders regularly have or have to develop. Integrity is a big deal. In order to make team function properly, you have to prove yourself to the team first. One of the things that helps team building is trust, and you need to be trusted. One of the best ways to earn this is to lead by example. A good leader has to get his or her hands dirty. That means you have to work. Our words and actions have to be based on an ethical and they have to be congruent. What we think, what we say, and what we do has to be the same. Needless to say, doing the right thing, that means righteousness, has a very positive impact on people and special, especially in team building. As family doctors, we have the obligation of keeping our knowledge and abilities current. So the leader has to embrace a culture of education where we can develop our skills and we can motivate others to do the same thing in their area of expertise. One of the strongholds of a team is knowing each strengths and capabilities. You should not be doing all that work by yourself, but you can ask and you should ask for help or inter consultation with your team members who are also health professionals. So we can expect a better outcome in the patient health. We are, um, we're using a superhero team here, so you can check out what leaders have the individual traits. Next slide, please. A good leader has to be committed to a mission. The collective goal is more important than the individual goals. Having a statement based on ethics, moral, and the necessity of helping to the development of humanity speaks good of a leader and motivates your crew. In order for this to happen, proper communication channels need to be established. A good review of the theory of communication is recommended for maintaining a good work environment. As I said before, trust is essential. Getting to know your teammates is a conscious labor you have to do. Establishing bonds and sharing experiences along with your actions will build trust. Being constant, being on time, leaving on time, Looking forward to self-development will help yourself and others to build discipline. By trying to be better, you will motivate others to try to be better themselves. Next one, please. A team has to have a mission. Part of the task of the leader is to educate the members on the common goal we share and to make sure that they accept this goal. It is of more relevance to remind them the importance of them being a part of this team and what they can addition to it with their knowledge and expertise. Being in a team means supporting people, being in their 
for them and assuring health. This will build trust among each other. A team is also a safety. Before health professionals, we are humans. So we sometimes can feel tired, sad, or disappointed. Whenever that happens, we can reach out for our team members and they will have our back, either for emotional support or with a distribution of your enterprise. When a person is a part of a team, we build strength. We are stronger. There are many things we cannot do on our own, but with the proper persons, we can go very far. Next slide, please. Being a part of a team is recognizing that each other has a different wisdom and skill set. Sharing each other's knowledge for improving everyone else's is why we need to encourage contribution and sharing experiences. As individuals working on a field dealing with death and major health problems, it is normal that from time to time we lose self-esteem. The leader has to detect whenever this happens and remind your, our teammates of the individual worth each one has and to strengthen their capability for resilience. Defining main issues to be solved, exploring possible solutions between all can help us determine the commitment we have as a team and it can help us distribute the errands among the crew. By working together, the health outcome should be easily reached. Next one. This is my favorite quote. As a conclusion, I would have to say that becoming a good leader can be achieved by keep on trying to become, to be the best version of yourself that you can be. Thank you so much for the opportunity. If you can put the next slide. This is my team. We are the YDM from all around Mexico working on the Commission on Anthropology. We are proud members of Amayali Wainakai YDM. And like them, we have more than 50 members of our movement, each trying to prove, improve and strengthen our specialty as all as the YDM who are here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Brando. Uh, I think yeah, an interesting take uh, with a superhero theme. I think yeah, and we deserve it. We deserve to be proud as superheroes. And thank you for appointing this. So moving to the second speaker uh, with uh, Dr. Maria uh, Jotik Ivanovic. She is a uh, family medicine specialist, soon to complete her uh, master degree in nutrition uh, also, she is a council member of the Vasco de Gama movement, uh, where she is uh, staying in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Sorry, I didn't say that right. Uh, Dr. Marina, uh, Yanni, please uh, take the stand. Thank you, Wainakaya and Alrazi, for the invitation and uh, letting me participate in this great event. event. Uh, as you said, my name is Marina Jotic Ivanovic and I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I'm going to present you the role of family doctor in patient education. Uh, let me just see, okay. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is the country that is uh, stated in Balkanian Peninsula in Europe surrounded with Croatia, Serbia, and Montenegro. As you can see, uh, we uh, have two colors in this map, the yellow and the green one. So uh, you can guess we are also divided inside in two entities, uh, administrative parts, uh, Republic of Srpska and Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so I live and work in Republic of Srpska uh, you can see here, uh, this is a city named Doboj and situated in north uh, eastern part of the country. Uh, I will not uh, talk uh, very much about healthcare system in Bosnia and Herzegovina because it is too complicated. Uh, I'm just uh, going to mention about the healthcare system uh, in the Republic of Srpska where I live and work. Uh, we are divided in primary health care, secondary health care, and tertiary health care. And uh, all is funded through National Health Care Fund. Uh, this is the health care center where I work. It is a public health care center uh, in my town. And uh, these are my colleagues. 
there are currently 23 doctors working in the Department of Family Medicine. And as you can see, most of us are women. Uh, we, uh, and most of us are uh, family medicine specialists. Uh, so many of us work in uh, urban setting and few of us work in rural areas in villages that are surrounding our city. Uh, the second uh, photo is uh, showing us making a house uh, for the World Family Doctor Day that we have celebrated. Um, sorry. Uh, so I'm going today. I'm going to talk about uh, the role of family medicine in patient education. Uh, according to American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, this is a process of influencing on patient behavior and producing the change in knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to maintain or improve health. As you can see, uh, the word itself, the word itself, doctor, comes from a Latin origin, docere, that means to teach. So basically, we are the, also the teachers for our patients. Uh, we do not only educate individuals, we also should educate families as well as communities. Even though uh, patient education is responsibility of all physicians, being a family physician uh, gives us a unique situation, a unique uh, role to take a leadership role in patient education. Because as you all mentioned, we are the place of first contact with our patient and uh, his contact with healthcare system. So we coordinate him and guide him to uh, sometimes uh, very difficult situations and to the healthcare system of our countries. Uh, what are the basic skills that we need to have and as to be patient educator. First of all, uh, we have to identify patients' educational needs. Uh, we have to gather information about patients' daily activities, about his knowledge on the subject that we are going to teach him, what are his beliefs, and what is his level of understanding. Uh, and then we have to tailor the education uh, to the patient's educational level and cultural background. Uh, we have to inform the patient of findings clearly and consistently. And also we have to discuss treatment plans in ter terms of specific behavior, encourage questions and improve appropriate answers. Uh, the communication that we have with the patient and this education role is not uh, only in one way, we also need to have uh, the, uh, the patient uh, participating uh, as we also do. And we also have to utilize appropriate written, audiovisual and computer-based materials. But during this process, we can find uh, some barriers to patient learning. A physical condition of the patient can be a barrier financial consideration, support system, misconception about disease and treatment, low literacy, cultural and ethic background, lack of motivation, environment, negative past experiences, and denial of personal responsibility are the barriers that we can find. And what is very important is that we select a topic that we are going to teach and educate our patients, our families or communities. So I'm going to present you uh, in short, uh, what my healthcare center has done in the past uh, two years. And we have been uh, working on the topic of breast cancer and uh, trying to raise awareness of this uh, disease among women in our community. 
uh, what was the aim? Uh, well, the aim of these workshops uh, was to increase the attention and uh, support for the awareness, early detection and treatment of the disease. But the major focus was on the breast self-examination and preventive mammography. Uh, so, uh, as you all know, breast cancer is the uh, leading cause of uh, death among women. And according to Global Count, for the last year, uh, around 2.3 million new cases uh, were established among women and around uh, six, uh, 600,000 deaths from breast cancer occurred in 2020. And this is a major problem uh, in low and middle income countries. So we have to think of a ways how to uh, lower these uh, numbers. Uh, first of all, these are the photos from our workshops. Uh, we have made also this frame uh, to encourage, encourage women to get involved in the breast cancer awareness and uh, to be there and to be uh, also our voice in the community. Uh, we have performed uh, three workshops during the October month. Uh, this one, these are the photos from 2019 where we still did not have pandemic so we could gather really. And around uh, 50 women uh, per workshop were presented, presented there. Uh, they, uh, the ages were from 18 years and above. Uh, we wanted to do so because we wanted uh, for the young ones to be our uh, voice in, uh, and uh, if they find, uh, uh, when they go home, they will ask their mother, sister, or grandmother, did they do and perform the uh, self-examination monthly? Did, uh, when did they come? To the mammography so they can lead the future better. Two minutes, uh, Dr. Marina. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the walk uh, that we organized in our Central Park uh, in uh, October uh, 2019. Uh, this was the walk of the for the support of the women uh, who were sick. Uh, many of them lost their vessels. So we supported uh, the ones that we lost and their families. And also we wanted to share that together we are stronger and we can do much better things and to improve and build, let's say, a better future for all of us. Uh, unfortunately, in, two, in 2020, we could not organize any workshops. We could not organize any gatherings like we did in 2019. Uh, but we organized a small gathering in our park again, uh, where we di distributed leaflets with breast self-examination. And also we distributed uh, masks. As you can see, they have the signs of a pink, pink ribbon. And uh, somehow we wanted to connect that preventive activities are important in, con uh, in communicable disease, but also in non communicable communicable disease, as is the breast cancer. Uh, also, I want to, to say that uh, uh, here uh, we had the support of our local authorities. And uh, as uh, with their support, uh, we were able to get a mobile mammogram uh, for the patients, uh, for the women living in uh, rural remote areas. So uh, hopefully when this pandemic is uh, over or things get better, we will be able to use it uh, more currently. Uh, also, I want to share with you that uh, being there for the patients is also uh, important to adjust ourselves uh, in the present. Uh, so we have to include also social media in their education. So we have uh, our uh, official Facebook and Instagram page uh, where we uh, post uh, on activities and uh, where our doctors working in our health center can uh, do presentations or small uh, advices for the patients regarding many diseases. 
uh, and uh, we are very happy and we are followed by many people in our community, but also uh, we get credits from uh, doctors and our colleagues uh, uh, outside our city. Dr. Marina, I think yeah, we are done. Uh, okay, uh, I just want to uh, say like Randall that uh, uh, we need to be the change that we wish to see in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marina. Th thank you, Dr. Marina. So uh, up next, I have the honor to present uh, Dr. Margaret Azimba. She is from the US, uh, family medicine doctor in Loma Linda, California and is affiliated with Loma Linda University Medical Center. She received her medical degree from University of Auckland, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. So, Dr. Margaret. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And it is a real privilege to be um, amongst all of you as the panelists. And also I'm looking forward to the question and answer part to really hear who is out there and who is listening to this. Because I think it's a really good topic, you know, as family medicine physicians, we are speaking from all over the world and I want to say good morning and good afternoon and good evening to you all, wherever you are. Um, I'm here in the United States um, on the West Coast and um, but I'm from New Zealand, grew up in New Zealand, and I think that our identity, as we have spoken about um, previously, is really dynamic and diverse. And so building on the previous topics, you know, thinking of the family medicine within the healthcare system and how important we are as part of the uh, pyramid of healthcare, and then also um, thinking about the diversity and how we need to approach health in a different way, whether it's urban or whether it's rural, and the importance of leadership in whatever role we do. And as you have seen from my previous panelists as well, there are often many roles that the family physician takes. Um, I also loved about um, docere or docere that the family medicine is really the, the teacher and um, so I build on that a little bit in that I'm looking at the family medicine physician as an administrator. And as an administrator, I think there are a lot of different roles. And as unique as family medicine is, and as unique as the panelists are, I can only speak to my own journey. Um, and it will be wonderful to hear other ideas and other thoughts of the family medicine as an administrator. I myself am going to be talking about um, really the World Lifestyle Medicine um, Council, which is a nonprofit organization, and that's my um, space of administration. It comes from a point that here in the United States, it shows that almost 80%, so 79% of all family physicians experience burnout. And I think that as we are dynamic and as we are diverse, it also means that with all of these hats, each cause, whether it's breast cancer or whether it's um, looking at screening, whatever it is, when it is something that is a really good cause, there is no limit to how much we can put in it. Um, and as family physicians, we have a really unique skill set because all through medical school and um, registrar or residency training, we are designed to look at a problem and solve it, to meet with somebody. And I, I liked the quote as well to really um, to look at the whole person and um, then to see them as a whole person and help them on their mm -hmm. healthcare journey journey to really help them diagnose and then treat from that and um, then we are also designed to be leaders and I love this question from Mel that as to what are the main contributors to burnout and I think that there are many many different answers to that but I think that it's a combination of systemic factors that um, just to answer that question, so systemic factors that mean that there is no limit to how much we can do. And that's a perfect recipe for burnout, even if it's something we're passionate about. Then also the system of um, 
sometimes not having the resources and it depends on what context that you work out but that futility that there is more that you can do than you have the um, facility and the resources to do and then um, we expect high standards of ourselves and as I say we wear many hats so you know I'm a family medicine physician I'm also an educator so here in Loma Linda I teach the medical students and the residents I'm a mother of four children and a wife it's our wedding anniversary today <laughs> and um, at the same time I'm a daughter so looking after um, the older generation I know that a lot of people can speak to that as well and we're bridge people so I'm from New Zealand but my mother is from the Netherlands in Europe and my father is from Africa so I think that all the people on the call you know <laughs> any one of these things can burn us out that combined with the passion and then what is administration it's leading it's the process or activity of running an organization. So you could be a chief medical um, officer in your own practice. You could be in, um, an administrator as in the social security. So it was lovely to hear from Brenda. For myself, it's in a nonprofit organization. And so that's just on the side as well. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the World Lifestyle Medicine Council because it came from this idea. Um, Oh, and there's another question I just want to answer. Do you think family physician will fare better as compared to other specialist administrators? That's a very good question. Um, and I think that it depends on how we look at it and how we fortify ourselves. Um, I think we have the potential to be the best administrators of any specialist because of our problem solving, because of our broad knowledge and because of our heart. We're family physicians because we really care about the patients. And I like that the idea that we're superheroes, but we're also really in the trenches with patients. So that combination of knowing, um, knowing our audience, knowing our patients, and really caring can make us phenomenal administrators. So back to the global burden of um, disease, you're welcome. <laughs> That's lovely, thank you. Um, Non-communicable diseases have overtaken infectious diseases as the biggest killers worldwide. This was actually back in 2017 already that Margaret Chan, the WHO, the World Health Organization uh, Director General, realized this and spoke about it publicly. And that's, so that's great, fits in with the sustainable development goals and with so many of the other things that we're looking at. Oh, thank you. Um, now we have also that there not only are, oh, it's frozen. <laughs> Thank you for the happy anniversary that somebody has just put. Um, my passion and the reason I came to be an administrator was from this non-communicable disease um, concept and public health concept to um, what needs to come into family medicine. So very briefly, I'm from New Zealand. I did orthopedic surgery. I came to the United States to marry my husband. Um, and then I did public health and global health. Uh, um, and so I spent six years retraining at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And I did my fellowships at the World Health Organization in Geneva and at the National Institute of Health here in the United States. On that journey, really thinking, realized that so much of disease is preventable. And as family medicine physicians, we have this unique opportunity because we have a relationship with the patient and we have this world health perspective. And yet we have this clinical time where we can be with the patient. So we can change this. So the intersection of family medicine and non-communicable disease, lifestyle medicine is it. And that's what I got passionate about. And that's why we started this nonprofit. The, um, it was called the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance and has now become the World Council of Lifestyle Medicine. Looking at obesity, which is a growing problem. It's and unfortunately, it's, thank you. It's growing in the places um, that it, the low and middle income countries is growing the most. So 71% of the global non-communicable disease burden is in low and middle income countries. And there's a double burden because there's still infectious disease. And COVID has really highlighted this in that there's undernutrition and there's malnutrition. And if you have non-communicable disease underlying it, 
then the disease, then infectious disease is much, much higher burden. There's this information note um, just from the World Health Organization really on COVID and the impact of non-communicable disease. So there is this global, what we call a syndemic and the Lancet um, back in 2019 looked, talked about the syndemic of obesity, undernutrition and climate change. So some of it is contextual as well. That planetary health, we can't talk about our own health without talking about the health of um, mm. oh, thank you, Mal, for being interested in lifestyle medicine. I, we can't talk about that without talking about the health of our own planet, because as a living ecosystem, we are part of that as well. So the part of the planet. Medicine is lifestyle medicine, really to be the first thing that you think of when you talk about six pillars, nutrition, exercise. Most of these we can talk about in more detail later. But what I do want to say is the Medicine Global Alliance. Um, and we have now places from North America, from South America, from, this is talking about the global syndemic, from Africa, from Australasia, all through the Pacific, and Asia. So it's great. Here we have people from um, Malaysia and our translator is from Hong Kong. Thank you for that as well. And um, also from Europe. So many family phys physicians and other specialties who are passionate about this lifestyle medicine course. Um, the Middle East cannot be forgotten. It's thanks to you that this is all organized and um, really a huge burden of um, non-communicable disease in many of those places. Internationally, as family medicine physicians, we can be the, um, oh yeah, PG too, we can be the, uh, uh, the, the catalyst in this conversation. And in the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance, we started from just three of us. Now it has become family physicians and other physicians in their own countries in over 40 countries. They have come together and each sister organization can be with, can join with the globalization um, and the Global Alliance or the world. Uh, it's part actually of the, the Lifestyle Medicine World Council. So Wait a second, Dr. Margaret. Lovely. Final words, this is my last slide, is that you can become certified and I'd love to answer many, many questions more, um, especially as the details, if you want to hear about the details of the administration. So thank you. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mark. That yeah, and it was an informative presentation with a new perspective uh, on subspeciality for family medicine, which we lack in, in, in maybe in several countries. But lifestyle medicine looks yeah, and shining with your efforts on it. Thank you. Okay, okay. so now moving to uh, Dr. Kwame, one minute. Okay, so uh, Dr. Kwame, are you with us? Okay. Yes. So okay, yeah. the role of family medicine, yeah, and uh, their community by Dr. Nana Kwame Ayasi Boating. Uh, Dr. Kwame is a family physician uh, and the lecturer in Kumasi, Ghana, uh, where he the current chair of the Afri One uh, Renaissance Young Doctor Movement of Wonka in the African region. Uh, Dr. Kwame, the stand is yours, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Adele, yeah. and thanks to. Uh, uh, the global YDM for this opportunity and um, kudos to Harris in particular, the CEO of Wonka who has put together a lot of this platform for us. Adele and team, kudos. Right, so um, this afternoon I'm going to talk to us about the role of family doctors in the community. Um, I bring you greetings from Afriwan Renaissance. Adele, I'm not able to control the slide. It's not, it's not moving. Right, so I bring you greetings from African Renaissance. That's the Young Doctors Movement of Wonka Africa. Okay, so um, for this session, the objective is to highlight our role in the community as family physicians. I'm going to celebrate some of the fantastic work being done by some young family physicians across the globe. 
And then we're going to discuss some of the challenges all of us are facing as family doctors in the community and look at how we can suggest possible solutions to these challenges. So we all aspire to be five-star doctors. That's what our training as family doctors teach us. Um, but both Wonka and then World Health Organization have five key points. So we are, we are supposed to be care providers, decision makers, communicators, managers, or team members. But cardinal within this definition is the fact that we are all community leaders, meaning both Wonka and the World Health Organization recognize the key role we as family doctors have in the communities as community leaders. Right, so when we talk about family doctors in the community, I look at it in several ways. So first of all, when you look at the community, you are looking at us being situated within the community of family doctors. And then within that space, we also have a bigger community of other doctors or other specialists. Then there's a bigger community of family doctors within the healthcare system where we work. And then we also have the geographical space and um, then the global space where we, we operate. So as family doctors, we, are, we represent a community within a community. And within all these community, communities, we share with them unique sociocultural characteristics and interests. And some of us, where we find ourselves operating, um, we've gained a lot of respect among the community members. They, they trust us. They believe that we are the best people to be able to provide them with the right kind of healthcare, and this one puts a lot of expectations. So they have expectations of us that we all struggle or try to, to, to meet. So I share with you one experience of a very good friend of mine by name, Dr. Vikesh Sharma, who is a family doctor in London, UK. He has a practice of um, going into the communities to engage West African population. So where he practices, he realized that quite a number of the patients who come to his practice either are from West Africa or majority of them were Portuguese speaking citizens. So what he did was that he paid the visits to the, the churches to engage with the West African community. And what, how this has helped him is to, um, is to equip him to be able to understand the peculiar needs of this population. Once again, when it came to health education, he realized that most of the materials that were being used for health education were in English. But some of the people in the originating from the Portuguese speaking communities could not understand English. So he engaged the local government to design um, education materials so that he'd be able to educate that. Through these initiatives, one, he was able to increase his um, patient population from West Africa, and number two, increase patient population from Portuguese speaking communities. And with that as well, um, he, he gained the trust and then established good rapport and relationship with these patients. Then I want to share with you another um, very vibrant and versatile young family doctor from Nigeria, Dr. Benji. So Benji has an NGO, which is nonprofit. And um, what, what they do is that they embark on campaigns and advocacy um, campaigns in the communities, they do anti-rape um, advocacy. And then during the COVID-19 pandemic, they provided COVID-19 relief support for people within the community. And I'm proud to say that Benji has led a group that has conducted free surgeries for more than 3,500 people free of charge in Nigeria. And he's won several awards and he's a toast of um, young family doctors in Nigeria. So there's one thing that we can all celebrate for. Next slide. Then I celebrate others all over the world. You see Sanka from Spice Root checking blood pressures or Melvina in Sierra Leone conducting free BP screening. And then Marita Douglas in Kenya um, doing home visits and, other, um, and a young doctor also in Kenya conducting air evacuation for a patient. And these are all rules that 
family doctors are playing in the community all over the world. Next slide. So with this role come with responsibilities and challenges. One major responsibility we all face, and I'm sure you all agree with me, is high demands and expectations from our patients. I know family doctors who, in their practice, patients will never leave a practice without seeing that particular doctor, or they will make sure that it's that particular doctor that attends to them when they are not well, or their families. And this puts a lot of demands and expectations on us. And then number two, in, in the midst of that, in primary care settings, a lot of governments do not put um, channel resources, a lot of funds into primary care settings. And so in spite of the demands on us, we still do not have enough to be able to meet their patient's demands. And then also, because of the increasing expectations, as Margaret presented, a number of family doctors burn out from commitments to our patients, their families, their communities, and all that. But th there are solutions to this. One is visibility. How can we be visible? So one thing I celebrate Wonka for is the World Family Doctor Day on 19th May, because it gives us an opportunity to be able to trumpet what we do as family doctors. And when we put it on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, and all that, people get to know what we do. And that also will push um, politicians and leaders to be able to look at family medicine as a very important specialty or a very important discipline within the um, healthcare delivery system. We also do not have enough family doctors. So all across the world, we need to increase training of family doctors so that we can play this role. Technology is very important. So at our primary care facilities in some African countries, most African countries actually, do not have electronic medical record system. These systems are important because then it will help us to be able to have an idea of where our patients are coming from, like Dr. Vikesh Sharma, who was able to know that a large percentage of his patients were from the West African population. We were able to look at their, generate data and be able to present it to opinion leaders on how they can support primary health care. So employing technology will also help us a great deal in terms of our role in the community. Next slide. Two minutes, Dr. Kwame. Yes, go ahead. Next slide. So I went on Facebook and I found this very beautiful picture from a giant of family medicine, that's John Wynne Jones. And Dr. John Wynne Jones has, I've been following him on Facebook and what he does is that he walks through the community and he takes beautiful pictures. And what I've learned from this is the fact that there is not a family doctor who is only involved in patient care or going into the community and then providing healthcare, but he's also into the beauty of the community. So just going in there can also be therapeutic for us to be able to prevent burnout and be able to overcome all the stress that we face um, from our work. And then you also see this young man, actually that's myself playing tennis. Um, I showed this slide also to let this picture to also tell you that we all need to also get involved in the community, not just in terms of providing healthcare, but join sporting clubs, join gyms in the community, be part of the community and by so doing we'll be engaging them and also getting healthy whilst we also overcome stress and overcome and also prevent burnout. So these are slides that I thought I should share. Next slide. Right, this is my last slide and um, it's quite personal to me and I'm sure some of you might share in this as well. So this one shows a picture of um, a typical funeral setting in Ghana and I'm sure in some African countries as well. So in, in, in Ghana and some African countries, funerals, um, you, when you report to a funeral as a guest, usually you may go around and then there is a, an announcer who announced that, okay, so this is Dr. Kwame, um, a prominent family doctor in the community and he's here to pay his respects. But part of it could also be that that person that you are attending the funeral may have been a client that you are seeing in your clinic. So one difficulty I always experience is whether to attend the funeral of my patient or not. Because if I show up and it's announced to the gathering that this is the doctor who was taking care of the disease or the patient who, is, who has died. One difficulty I always experience is whether it's an appreciation of my effort to keep the person alive or that I failed in the effort to keep him alive. I am, so the next time you're also confronted with the, an invitation to attend a client's funeral, you may face the same dilemma I have to go or not to go. The decision is yours. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, doctor. So we are going to have our last topic for today before uh, questions. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Salam Hassa, who is uh, going to tell us about family doctor in conflict area. Um, Dr. Salam is a fourth year resident in the Palestinian Board of Family Medicine from Palestine, Gaza. So welcome, Dr. Salam. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I have the control. Okay, thank you. So, um, as you know, thank, uh, thank you first for uh, this nice introduction. Uh, as you know, um, a family doctor can work in uh, a wide spectrum of different environments. But what about working in a conflict area? How things look like? And what are the type of challenges that are related to the working as a family doctor in an environment where there is a conflict? In my presentation, I'm going to answer those questions, but I feel it is important to tell you a little bit about the conflict that we had in that we have in Palestine. As you see, this is Palestine in a green color, where people, Palestinian people, were living so peacefully. But then and during the last 73 years, the Israeli occupation occupied part of the Palestine. And then it continued to build colonial settlements that lead to more and more shrinkage of the land. So we are now left with a small green area. The white one, the white one is occupied Palestine by, Isra by Israeli occupation. And the green one is West Bank. Uh, this one is West Bank and Gaza, which of them is Palestinian territory now. I'm living in, in Gaza, so let me zoom in, zoom in. Um, yeah, so I'm living here along with other two million Palestinian population, but this area is the most populated, densely populated area in the world, and we are under blockade since 2007 by uh, Israeli occupation. And this means it is extremely difficult to travel outside Gaza. It's extremely difficult, difficult to get things from out into Gaza. And because of this, we are lacking the access uh, into clean water, into sanitation. Uh, we have bad sanitation. We have a state of poverty, unemployment, and we barely have electricity for three to four hours per day. And so it is not uh, strange that the UN report in 2012 tell that my place, Gaza, will not be livable by 2020. And um, um, I can imagine after those facts, uh, you may now imagine that the Palestinian family doctors are in their clinic crying in the corners, which is, which is not the state. Actually, we are very aware of our challenges in, in, in Gaza. And we are trying to uh, find solutions for those, uh, those challenges. We are trying to overcome them with the minimal resources that we have. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to, to talk about the most important challenges that we have as a family doctors in Gaza. Uh, first, of all, first of all, it is the challenge of establishment of family medicine specialty. This is actually one of our most important uh, uh, challenges was, and because, next please, Dr. Adel. Yeah, and because uh, as you see here, in the past people was able to go outside Gaza to take their speciality, then to come back into Gaza. But this is not possible after the blockade in 2007 by the Israeli occupation. And so uh, a leader and the family doctor idea was, okay, we have the minimal resources, but then we have to use them to establish our own family medicine speciality. Uh, next, please. And we actually succeed in this. Uh, now we are having uh, 40 residents in family medicine board, Palestinian family board, and also a 30 graduated family doctor. So we managed to solve this uh, first challenge. Next, please. The second challenge is about the, uh, the shortage of uh, basic med medication. 
And the, the shortage of basic medications is about 45%. So uh, imagine that you are in your clinic, your hypertensive patient come to your a clinic asking for his antihypertensive medication. You know that this patient don't have the money to, uh, to buy his medication and neither you have this medication. So this big challenge is solved by uh, being uh, as a family doctor in Gaza to be aware of the non-governmental organizations that can offer this medication for free for the citizens of Gaza, like UNARWA, United Nations uh, um, clinics that can help the refugees to provide them with medication. Next, please. Uh, the next challenge is the aggression. Uh, so the previous facts, are really difficult, but this one is the most difficult because from time to time we have Israeli aggression on Gaza. I myself am a survivor of four wars, 2008, 12, 14, and 21. And if you look to the human coast, it's not easy to process all of this. Next, please. The problem, of, uh, the problem with family doctors, with us as the family doctors in Gaza, is the continuity of care during the aggression. It's so important that to know that uh, the, the, the patients need their family doctors the most during this time. But during this time, we are not able to access our patients. And if, if you mention that the aggression is simple, actually, and unfortunately, it's not. It's, uh, um, as you see from this picture, air, uh, Israeli air strike are hitting uh, some building in Gaza. And we lived like this for 11 days started in, 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 uh, in the last 10th of May in 2021. And as you see in 2014, it is 51 days. So the continuity of the care is not easy. Next, please. We try to solve this problem to use our minimal resources with electricity and internet and to have telemedicine program to reach our patients, but it wasn't easy, but we are trying our best at least to, to solve the problem partially. Next, please. And the next challenge is uh, with each aggression, we know we will have waves of more psychological disorders, acute stress disorders, grief, post-traumatic stress disorders, and other non-communicable diseases which were controlled. They are now not controlled because the patients have no access to the clinic. So, um, uh, to solve this this uh, challenge, actually, the family doctor in Gaza have to be aware of this of this and to to give more focus for our patients after each aggression, at least for three months to uh, to try to bring things back to normal again. Next, please. Uh, the next challenge is about the um, the the lack of possibilities for training and international connections. Uh, it's really unusual to have my voice in this panel this day. Thanks for Arez Young Doctors Movement and Wolf and Wanakai and for my friend Bissan to help me to, 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 to hear a voice from Gaza. And uh, we try to solve this problem from time to time. For example, in 2018, we have Dr. Abu Mrahil, he's a family doctor from UK. He, um, by chance, he was, he was uh, visiting Gaza. So we, we grabbed this chance and asked him to come to our lecture to explain us for uh, family medicine in UK. UK and to have some of his experience. Next, next, please. The last challenge is really the most important one. As a family doctor, we have a responsibility not only to advocate and support our patients, but also to support and advocate our whole healthcare system. Um, we are in Gaza as a family doctor. We don't have billions of dollars to, to refresh our healthcare system, but we can reach by our voices to mainstream media like Time magazine and Fight magazine, next please, and also to talk with leaders all around the world about the situation in order to encourage the people and to enhance them with their administration to, book, to put a pressure on the Israeli occupation to end the siege, to end the blockade, to end. Uh, this uh, uh, burden of not having the right of a proper health and proper life in Gaza. Next, please. And as you see, uh, those beautiful two kids from Gaza, this is a few weeks ago during the Israeli aggression. Their neighborhoods were was damaged by the um, Israeli air strike. Those kids are not crying. They are happy and joyful, smiling, because they managed to rescue their pet. It was the fish. So they, they really 
uh, find a way to find uh, a celebration moment and to focus on that small light in the middle of darkness. Actually, the family doctor has to do the same in a conflict area. He had to search for hope, to search for that light and to work on it. Even each time he lost the control of uh, hypertensive patients and have waves of psychological problems, it's okay. He don't have to be part of the problem. He has to be part of the solution and to focus on that light in order to help himself and his uh, people. Uh, and for sure, he has to have the problem solving the skills. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Salam, for shedding light uh, on this uh, humanitarian suffering. Uh, I think yeah, and we didn't have this uh, point of view before that only our clinic to stay on open for all of our patients is a blessing by itself. Exactly. Uh, now we, yeah, now we are moving to uh, a word uh, from our uh, young doctor movement uh, chairs. Uh, we have Dr. Gabi and Dr. Gabriela and Dr. Anas and uh, uh, Dr. Gabi is a family medicine uh, consultant from Argentina, where she is the chair of Wainakai, uh, Young Doctor Movement, uh, and representative of the CIMF uh, Executive uh, Committee. And Dr. Anas al is a family medicine uh, specialist uh, and, and also has a master in health economics. Uh, and he is the chair of the Arazi uh, Young Doctor Movement. Uh, so, Dr. Gabi, the floor uh, is yours. Well, thanks, Adele, for your kind presentation. Just a few words. Uh, first of all, I want to give uh, a special thanks to all of you for attending today to this Wonka YDM Global Webinar. And as I'm very grateful today, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Harris Lihidakis from Wonka for helping us once again, and to my partner, Anas, and al Rasi Movement and Wainakai Movement for accepting this challenging idea of working together in the planification of this webinar about um, identity of family doctors. So I'm, I'm very proud to say that I believe that this wonderful experience is a big step given forward to strengthen ties and look distance and make distance, sorry, look shorter among family doctors all over the world. So thank you very much once again. And uh, thank you, Adele and Anas. That's your turn now. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Gabby. Thank you, for Adele, Tanya, and everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, Doctor, okay. we can hear the fans. Yes. So, so first of all, I would uh, like to thank uh, you all for attendance and uh, for participating. Thank uh, to all panelists, Harris, uh, and uh, uh, special thanks to Adel and uh, Tanya for organizing this great job. Uh, I would like specifically thank uh, Gabby and YDM Leeds for this nice idea to bring all family doctors worldwide together in uh, one village. Actually, this is maybe the first time to feel the feeling of small village, uh, of uh, connecting family doctors for, from all over the world. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it uh, was a great uh, chance for networking, friendship, and more collaboration. I hope that this webinar will continue for the next years with more success. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you all for our uh, yani great chairpersons uh, for yani making us uh, happy and easy to do uh, this presentation, to collect all of the panelists from all over the world. Uh, I think for now we will move for uh, uh, question and answers. Uh, we have three questions or four in the chat section. Uh, no one uh, put it in the question and answer section. So we will have a uh, first question for Dr. Uh, Margaret. They asked you, Dr. Margaret, uh, if lifestyle medicine can stand on its own uh, as a specialty. What do you think? In, in a few words, please. 
Yes, so thank you for that question. And the answer is yes. So it is actually um, already gaining certification as an independent specialty in um, the United States. But I don't think that that should detract from the fact that lifestyle medicine should be the first approach for everybody in any specialty. So just like, I think like family medicine, um, every good doctor has a little bit of their family medicine in them. You know, any cardiologist can actually still really speak to the patient like a family medicine person can. So lifestyle medicine can be throughout, but yes, it can be its own specialty and you can become board certified and board certified in lifestyle as well as family medicine. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marcus for this. Uh, I will leave the floor open for the next question, which is the uh, how to convince more medical students and more people into family medicine as it is lacking the private sector or the, uh, the higher uh, pay role uh, compared to other specialties. I don't know if anyone wants to answer this from an experience or something. Yeah, I can, I'm sure a lot of people have um, yeah. insights, but I just wanted to say that money is not what make, has ever made anybody happy. Um, and I think that if you look at the fulfillment that can come from family medicine, that is incredibly important. The diversity, the relationships, the um, leadership. And I know that um, Dr. Kwame had something to say as well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kwame, please. Yeah, is, is my get finished? I wanted her to finish what she was saying. Okay. Uh, yeah. And from uh, I would I would add on this uh, from the country point of view, we have here in Saudi Arabia, we are shifting our uh, whole uh, okay, yeah, healthcare system based on primary and prevention. So as uh, yeah, some of you may heard about the Saudi Vision in 2030, uh, it is a national wide. Uh, uh, effort to guide medical students and more people into primary care and family medicine uh, in, uh, uh, in specifically. Uh, so that will be any more uh, uh, encouraging for medical students to join in family medicine. Uh, I think uh, we are done for the questions. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will leave it with David Cartania to end the session for today. And then yeah, it was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Adele. Thank you all for participating. Let's keep encouraging family medicine and spreading the word about what family doctors can achieve for the healthcare system and population worldwide. So thank you all and have a nice day.